Carcinoma refers to a type of cancer that forms in epithelial tissues, which include the tissues that line the surfaces and cavities of the body, and in this case, the oral cavity. Oral squamous cell carcinoma specifically arises from the oral squamous epithelium, which upon a close-up view is made up of thin and flat stratified layers of squamous cells. These cells act as a protective barrier, covering and shielding the underlying tissues within your oral cavity. Depending on the location, the oral epithelium may be keratinized or non-keratinized. Keratinized tissue has a proteinaceous layer of keratin on top that protects the tissue from wear and tear, such as on the hard palate, gingiva, and the top or the dorsal surface of the tongue. Non-keratinized is seen on the buccal and labial mucosa, lateral and ventral borders of the tongue and floor of the mouth. Beneath this epithelial layer lies the lamina propria, a connective tissue layer separated from the epithelium by a basement membrane. In many regions, a deeper layer called the submucosa, composed of dense irregular connective tissue, is also present. And in some areas, however, the submucosa is absent and the lamina propria is directly bound to underlying bone or muscle. If you want a more detailed explanation of the oral mucosa structure, don't forget to check out my separate video dedicated to this topic. Let's look at the etiology of oral squamous cell carcinoma. Oral squamous cell carcinoma develops due to a range of environmental, infectious, immunologic and genetic factors. Many of these factors are also responsible for the development of oral potentially malignant disorders, which are a group of clinically identifiable lesions such as leukoplakia, erythroplakia, oral submucous fibrosis, and oral lichen planus. All these carry a higher risk of transforming into oral squamous cell carcinoma over time. Major contributors include tobacco use, which contains carcinogens like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and tobacco-specific nitrosamines. Ethanol in alcohol increases mucosal permeability to carcinogens. Betelquid contains nitrosamines and aricoline that promote mutagenesis. Human papilloma virus, especially type 16, contributes to genetic alterations in oral epithelial cells. Poor nutrition like low intake of fruits, vegetables, and vitamin D, environmental exposures like dust, heavy metals, and poor oral hygiene, inherited conditions like Fanconi anemia and dyskeratosis congenita impairs DNA repair mechanisms. And finally, immunosuppression seen in HIV and AIDS patients, patients who are transplant recipients. All these reduces tumor surveillance. Let's look at the step-by-step -step progression from normal epithelium to invasive oral squamous cell carcinoma. Exposure to carcinogens causes DNA mutations in oral epithelial cells leading to abnormal growth, known as hyperplasia. If the carcinogen persists, cells develop abnormal structural changes, including variations in size, shape, and organization, but remain confined to the epithelium. This is called dysplasia. Dysplasia can be mild, moderate, or severe. The full thickness of the epithelium shows atypia, but the basement membrane remains intact, so the cancer is still localized, known as carcinoma in situ. So dysplasia is considered precancerous and is seen only in some parts of the tissue, while carcinoma in situ is when these abnormal cells involve the entire thickness of the epithelium. Once the basement membrane is breached, malignant cells invade the connective tissue, blood vessels, and lymphatics. This marks invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So the integrity of the basement membrane is the line between non-invasive and invasive cancer. On a molecular level, the normal balance between genes that prevent tumors, known as tumor suppressors, and those that promote cell growth or oncogenesis is lost. Tumor suppressor genes like p53, retinoblastoma or RB gene, p16, which usually repair DNA or destroy abnormal cells, become inactivated or mutated. Here's how tumor suppressor genes normally protect us. During the cell cycle, checkpoints at G1, S and G2 phases act like security gates. Tumor suppressor genes like p53, RB and p16 stop the cycle if there's any DNA damage, either helping repair it or pushing the cell into rest or G0 or death phase. 
But in cancer, these genes like P53, RB, and P16 become inactivated or mutated, disabling these checkpoints. The result is damaged cells slip through, divide uncontrollably, and that's how cancer starts. At the same time, oncogenic pathways become active. Under normal conditions, a cell only grows when a growth factor binds to a receptor on the surface of an epithelial cell, like the epithelial growth factor receptor. This triggers a signal inside the cell through proteins like RAS and leads to control division via pathways like MOP. But in cancer, this system gets hijacked. The RAS gene is mutated and it becomes permanently active even without any growth signal. This means the cell keeps receiving growth signals all the time, leading to uncontrolled division and tumor growth. Let's now come to the clinical features of oral squamous cell carcinoma. Oral squamous cell carcinoma is a common form of cancer worldwide. It makes up about 90% of oral malignancies and affects appearance, speech, swallowing, and taste perception. Oral squamous cell carcinoma primarily impacts men, especially middle-aged to older men, who are the most at risk. Although the exact cause of oral squamous cell carcinoma is not fully understood, individuals with oral potentially malignant disorders, as previously mentioned, are more likely to develop oral cancer than those with healthy oral mucosa since they share many of the same risk factors. Oral potentially malignant disorders include lesions such as leukoplakia, erythroplakia, oral submucous fibrosis, and oral lichen planus. You can find detailed illustrative videos on all these four topics under my oral pathology playlist. Out of all these potentially malignant disorders, oral leukoplakia carries a higher risk of turning into cancer. This risk is higher in non-homogeneous types of leukoplakia. One rare but serious form is called proliferative verrucous leukoplakia. It appears as multiple thick, white, warty patches with a predilection for gingival tissues and is usually asymptomatic. However, it behaves aggressively, often comes back after removal, and up to 60 to 100% of cases eventually develop into oral cancer. Sometimes areas of leukoplakia may develop red patches. This suggests severe DNA damage and cellular atrophy, which makes the underlying blood vessels more visible, giving a reddish appearance. At this stage, the lesion is called erythroleukoplakia, showing both red and white areas. Over time, it may progress into a fully red lesion known as erythroplakia, which carries a much higher risk of malignancy. About half of oral erythroplakia cases progress into dysplasia, arthinoma in situ, or invasive cancer, making it one of the most dangerous precancerous conditions in the mouth. And 85 to 90 percent of early oral squamous cell carcinomas manifests initially as oral erythroplakia. In its early stages, oral squamous cell carcinoma is often painless. However, as it progresses, patients may experience discomfort and the lesion may develop ulceration, nodularity, and firm attachment to surrounding tissues. Oral submucous fibrosis often presents with burning sensations or sensitivity to spicy foods and sometimes with small blisters on the palate. Under the microscope, Oral submucous fibrosis shows changes in both the epithelial cells and the connective tissue structure. It has a 7.5% risk of becoming cancerous over 17 years and can also occur alongside other potentially malignant lesions like oral leukoplakia. Oral lichen planus is an inflammatory condition that affects about 1-2% to of the population. Its risk of turning into cancer ranges from 0.07 to 5.8%, depending on the type. Let's wrap up this video with the treatment options for oral squamous cell carcinoma. Managing oral squamous cell carcinoma requires a multi-pronged approach. The first step is often surgical removal of the tumor, along with a margin of healthy tissue to ensure complete excision. In many cases, especially where large areas are removed, reconstructive surgery is needed to restore function and appearance using flaps or grafts. Radiotherapy is commonly used post-surgery to destroy any remaining cancer cells. In more advanced cases, it is combined with chemotherapy, which helps shrink the tumor and improve treatment response. Immunotherapy is one of the newest and most promising treatments. Drugs work by helping the immune system recognize and attack cancer cells 
by blocking immune breaks that the tumor uses to hide. So depending on the stage and behavior of the cancer, treatment can include one or a combination of these options. I hope you really enjoyed this video. Please do like, subscribe, share and comment if you have any questions. Thank you for watching.